Good evening. Uh, William Burroughs needs very little introduction. He's one of the best known literary and cultural figures of our century. Um, this will be his first reading anywhere since the release of Cities of the Red Knight, his newest novel. Uh, Ken Kesey, who by no means agrees with everything Burroughs says or writes, has said this about this novel. Cities of the Red Knight is not only Burroughs' best work, but a logical and ripening extension of all of Burroughs' work. The last time Mr. Burroughs was in Austin five years ago, he was made an honorary citizen by the then mayor, Jeff Friedman. So please welcome home William Burroughs. Space commemorates the ominous nuclear accident at Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Coming events cast a mushroom shaped shadow. I recollect some years ago with Newcastle on Tyne. Uh, I was on a panel with a Dr. Pike, he called himself a scientist, and he was defending the expansion of nuclear installations, responsible politicians know what they are doing, and nuclear power plants in England have a splendid safety record. And I said to him, well, Dr. Pike, as a scientist yourself, you are doubtless acquainted with the fruit fly experiments in which generations of fruit flies exposed to radiation have clearly demonstrated that there are no favorable mutations resulting from such radiation levels as would be massively released in a major industrial accident. The fruit flies all mutated to be sure wouldn't you? <laughs> that all the mutations observed were unfavorable, grossly unfavorable. Just let me ask you one question, Doctor. Do you want to see your own daughter born with two cunts? <laughs> well, he didn't know how to answer me. The crucial issue here is not uh, the initial casualties of a nuclear accident, but the long-range uh, cumulative damage to the human genetic pool, and responsible biologists bluntly warn, it is dirty enough already. If we see the Earth as a spaceship, and go further to invoke the comparison of a lifeboat. It is a vital concern to all of us in this lifeboat. If the officers pollute the supply of food and water, distribute supplies on a grossly inequitable basis, irradiate the boat, or blow it out from under us. And what more blatant evidence a conspiracy to irradiate or explode the earth and the development and use of an animal. On the occasion of the first atomic explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, the founding father himself, entertained the possibility of a chain reaction that would ignite the atmosphere. Twenty years later, he still believed that nuclear fission would destroy the planet. We are become Shiva, 
Destroy your worlds, he said, and wiped a tear out of the corner of his eye. He said it on TV in 1965, and various highly placed dignitaries appeared to say it was a very difficult decision. They're talking about the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima. God defend us all from a difficult decision in the Pentagon. <clears throat> Nobody does more harm than folk who feel bad about doing it. <clears throat> now, of course, the present-day apologists of nuclear power are leaning very far in the other direction. Not a single death or serious injury. Well, look at all the people killed in cars. What are you going to do? Take people's cars away from them? Oh, uh, well, they say it's, of course, it's a calculated risk. Well, I wonder uh, just exactly whose calculations. Now, these uh, nuclear enthusiasts, many of whom supported the disastrous Vietnam War, would have us believe that Oppenheimer was a hysterical, alarmist, and bleeding-hearted liberal do-gooder, infected with latent ideological bias. That's a phrase from uh, William Buckley, Jr. <laughs> well, perhaps uh, Oppenheimer's calculations involved, uh, should we say, a quantitative error, Given sufficient uh, concentration of nuclear fission, uh, such as would occur in a major nuclear war, and uh, Project Shiva becomes operational. But mm. now, Daddy Long Legs looked like Uncle Sam on stilts, and he ran this osteopath clinic outside of East St. Louis and took in a few junky patients. For two notes a week, they could stay on the nod in green lawn chairs and look at the oaks and grass stretching down to a little lake in the sun. And the nurse moves around the lawn with her silver tray feeding the junk in. We called her mother, wouldn't you? <clears throat> and Doc Benway and me was holed up there after a rumble in Dallas involving this aphrodisiac ointment. Doc goofed on either and mixed in too much Spanish fly and burned the prick off the police commissioner. <clears throat> so we come to Daddy Longlegs to cool off and we find him cool and casual in a dark room with potted rubber plants with a silver tray on the table where he likes to see a week in advance. Nurse shows us to a room with rolls and wallpaper, and we have this bell, like any hour of the day or night, just ring, and Mother charges in with a loaded hypo. Well, one day, we are sitting out in the lawn chairs with lap robes. It was a fall day, and leaves turning sun cold on the lake, and Doc picks up a piece of grass. Junk turns you on, a vegetable is green, see? Now, green fix should last a long time. We check out of the clinic and rent a house, and Doc starts cooking up this green junk. And the basement is full of tanks, smell like a compost heap of junkies. So finally, he draws off this heavy green fluid and loads it into a hypo big as a bicycle pump. Now we must find a worthy vessel, he says. We flush out this old goofball artist and tell him he's pure Chinese age from the Ling Dynasty. Doc shoots the whole pint of green right into the main line. The yellow jacket turns fibrous gray green and withers up like an old turnip. I say, I'm getting out of here, me and Doc says, an unworthy vessel, obviously. I withdraw from the case. 